Before we dive into our story, I'd like to remind you that you're listening to Woo English, where we learn English through storytelling. Our story today is educational and meant to enhance your understanding of historical events and characters. We present this story using clear and simple sentences to make learning both effective and enjoyable. If you find this helpful, please show your support by liking this video. It really helps us out. And while we explore these historical figures, remember, we aim to educate and inform, not to glorify or encourage their actions. Feel free to leave a comment with your thoughts or questions, and let's engage with history together. Now, let's begin our story. Chapter 1. Early Life In the small village of Arras, nestled in the northern reaches of France, a child named Louis was born into a world teetering on the brink of monumental change. It was the year 1760, a period when the old ways of monarchy and aristocracy were being quietly questioned by the whisper of revolution. Louis's family was neither wealthy nor poor, dwelling comfortably as middle-class artisans known for their skill in woodworking. Louis's early life was marked by the rustic charm of village festivities and the solemnity of seasonal harvests. His father, Pierre, was a well-respected craftsman, and his mother, Marie, was known for her wisdom and kindness throughout their community. From a young age, Louis was taught the value of hard work and the joy of crafting something beautiful from raw materials. Lessons that mirrored the larger ethos of a society built on the foundations of tradition and toil. Education for Louis began at the age of seven. Unlike the privileged classes, whose children often received their schooling from private tutors, Louis attended the local schoolhouse. It was a modest building, with walls lined with books that smelled of leather and wood polish. His teacher, Monsieur Dubois, was a stern yet fair man who believed deeply in the enlightening power of education. He introduced Louis to the works of the Enlightenment thinkers like Voltaire and Rousseau. These books, though complex, were broken down by Monsieur Dubois into simpler concepts that Louis and his classmates could grasp. It was in these early lessons that Louis first encountered the ideas of liberty and equality, concepts that resonated with him more deeply than the tales of kings and queens that filled the history books. He learned about the stark divides between the social classes in France understanding early on that not everyone benefited equally from the laws and taxes set by the distant rulers in Paris. As Louis grew, so did his curiosity about the world beyond his village. His father, recognizing his son's keen mind, saved up to purchase a few books that were beyond the school's curriculum. Among these were more detailed accounts of political philosophies, which Louis devoured eagerly often reading late into the night by the light of a flickering candle. His mother, observing his growing passion for such subjects, supported his education by discussing the characters and the moral questions raised in his books during their meals. The influence of his parents was profound. From his father, Lewis inherited a meticulous nature and a hands-on approach to solving problems. From his mother, he learned compassion and the importance of understanding others' hardships. These values shaped Louis into a thoughtful young man, poised with a balanced view of the world. As the air in France thickened with talks of change and reform, so did the conversations in the local tavern, where Louis, now a teenager, spent evenings listening to the adults discuss the future of their country. It was a time of intellectual awakening for Louis as the abstract injustices he read about in his books became the very real topics of debate among his neighbours and friends. Through these formative years, Lewis's character was moulded by a blend of academic learning and the practical wisdom imparted by his community. Each day added a layer to his understanding of the complexities of society and his role within it. Unbeknownst to him, 
These early experiences were preparing him for a life deeply intertwined with the revolutionary upheavals that were soon to sweep across France, challenging him to apply the lessons of his youth to the harsh realities of a nation in turmoil. As we leave the young Louis at the threshold of adulthood, the echoes of revolution grow louder, promising a future filled with both peril and promise. The story of his early life lays the foundation for the extraordinary journey that awaits, a journey not just of personal growth, but also of profound historical impact. Chapter 2 The Spark of Interest As Louis entered his teenage years, the gentle ripples of curiosity that had begun in his early childhood transformed into a torrent of intellectual thirst. The village of Arras, with its cobbled streets and bustling market days, became both his playground and his place of study. Beyond the woodwork and the harvests, beyond even the boundaries of his formal education, Louis found himself drawn to the pulsing heart of political discussions that often took over the corner tables of the local tavern. It was during one such frosty autumn evening that Louis first truly understood the power of ideas. The air inside the tavern was thick with the smell of wood smoke and the rich, earthy aroma of freshly poured ale. A group of men, some from Arras and others travellers passing through, were heatedly debating the influence of King Louis XVI on the worsening economic crisis. Each man argued his point with vigour, their faces animated under the flickering candlelight. Louis, initially there to fetch an order for his father, found himself rooted to the spot, listening intently. One traveller, a merchant from Paris, spoke of the Enlightenment, a cultural movement that championed reason and individualism over tradition and monarchical authority. The ideas he described were radical, filled with visions of a society where common men had a voice as loud as that of the nobles. The young Louis was captivated. That night, after returning home, he lay awake, the merchant's words echoing in his mind. The following days saw Louis spending more time at the tavern, engaging in discussions, and asking questions that often made the adults pause and think. His voracious appetite for knowledge led him to seek out newspapers and pamphlets, many of which were passed from hand to hand in secret, their contents deemed subversive by the loyalists. These papers brought news of unrest in Paris, stories of hunger and desperation that seemed worlds away from the relatively peaceful life in Arras. Yet it was the discussions of ideas like liberty, equality, and fraternity that struck a chord with Louis. These were not just abstract concepts. They were calls to action, beckoning to those who dared to dream of change. As his understanding deepened, so did his resolve to learn more. Louis began to organize small gatherings with his friends where they would read sections of Rousseau's The Social Contract or Paine's Common Sense. These meetings were held in secret, often in the loft of Louis's family barn. Here, the young men and women of Arras could discuss their thoughts freely, away from prying eyes. Louis's leadership qualities became apparent during these gatherings. He had a way of explaining complex ideas in simpler terms, making them accessible to his friends who had not had the benefit of as much education. His passion was infectious, inspiring his peers to consider not just the injustices faced by the French people, but also their potential power to enact change. The more he learned, the more Louis felt a growing sense of responsibility. He saw how the struggles of the peasants and the burgeoning bourgeoisie were linked by common chains of oppression and neglect. This realization helped him to articulate a vision of a unified France, free from the yoke of arbitrary royal power. Yet his burgeoning political consciousness also brought challenges. His father, 
wary of the rising tensions and the potential dangers of dissent, cautioned Louis to be mindful of where his words led him. Pierre loved his son and admired his fervor, but knew all too well the price that could be paid for defiance. Despite his father's warnings, Louis could not be swayed from the path he had chosen. His mind, once open to the possibilities of what could be, could not be closed. As news of the estate's general reached Arras, calling for representatives to help address the nation's crises, Louis knew that his life was about to change. He felt a profound duty to participate, to lend his voice to those who had none. Chapter 3 Paris in Turmoil As the dawn of 1789 approached, Paris was a city of stark contrasts. Splendor and squalor lay intertwined, with the grandiose palaces of the rich casting long shadows over the cramped, dirty streets where the poor struggled to survive. Louis, now more deeply involved in the revolutionary ideas circulating in Arras, decided it was time to witness the conditions of the capital firsthand. Upon arriving in Paris, the sheer scale of the city overwhelmed him. The streets buzzed with a chaotic blend of carriages, street vendors and crowds. However, beneath this bustling surface, there was an undercurrent of tension and despair. Paris was not just a city of opulence. It was also a hub of hardship. The majority of Parisians belonged to the Third Estate, which comprised peasants, artisans and bourgeoisie, middle-class professionals, all burdened by disproportionate taxes and a lack of political representation. Louis quickly learned that while he and his friends in Arras discussed the principles of fairness and equality, here in Paris, those principles were matters of daily survival. The economic conditions were dire. France's involvement in the American Revolution had drained the royal treasury, leading the government under King Louis XVI to levy even more taxes on the already struggling populace. Bread, a staple food, became so expensive that even a day's wages could barely cover the cost of a loaf. Louis saw mothers haggling desperately at markets their faces etched with the fear of going home empty-handed to their hungry children. Socially, the city was a powder keg of resentment. The opulent lifestyles of the nobility and clergy were funded by the toils of the poor, a glaring injustice that fueled the anger of the common people. At lavish parties, the elite would flaunt their wealth with extravagant displays of food and fashion, seemingly oblivious to the suffering outside their gilded doors. Politically, Paris was a vortex of revolutionary thought. Pamphlets and newspapers, many printed illegally, circulated throughout the city, advocating for a range of reforms from moderate changes to radical restructuring of society. Salons and cafes hummed with passionate debates about liberty, equality, and fraternity. Here, the Enlightenment ideas Louis had read about were no longer abstract theories. They were urgent calls to action. One evening, in a dimly lit tavern, Louis attended a meeting of what would soon be known as the National Assembly. The room was packed with representatives from the Third Estate, each sharing grievances and proposing solutions. The air was thick with the smoke of candles and the fervor of revolution. Louis listened intently as a delegate spoke passionately about the need for a constitution, for laws that would protect every citizen's rights, not just the privileges of the elite. Amidst these discussions, Louis met Jean-Paul, a young printer who had been distributing revolutionary materials at great personal risk. Jean-Paul described the secretive nature of his work, the constant threat of arrest, and his deep belief in the cause of freedom. Inspired by Jean-Paul's courage and commitment, Louis felt a renewed sense of purpose. He began helping to distribute the clandestine pamphlets, each page a seed of revolution. 
As winter turned to spring, the conditions in Paris worsened. A harsh frost had devastated the crops, leading to further food shortages. The streets filled with protests and marches, the air ringing with the cries of bread and equality. Louis marched alongside men and women, rich and poor, united by their demand for change. The royal forces watched nervously, their muskets at the ready, but for the moment held back by the sheer number of protesters. It was in these tumultuous times that Louis's resolve hardened. The plight of the Parisians was not just a political issue, it was a human crisis. The stories he had heard and the suffering he had witnessed etched themselves deep into his heart, driving him to advocate not just for incremental reforms, but for a complete overhaul of the French societal structure. Chapter 4 The Meeting As the Estates General convened in early May 1789, Louis found himself at the heart of what would soon become a historic turning point for France. The air was thick with anticipation, and the burden of expectation weighed heavily on all who entered the doors of Versailles. One evening, as the debates raged on, Louis received a discreet invitation to attend a secret meeting. It was to be held in a secluded manor house on the outskirts of Versailles, away from the prying eyes of royal spies and loyalist sympathizers. The note was sparse, offering no names, only a time and a place. Driven by curiosity and a burgeoning sense of duty, Louis accepted. The night was dark as Louis made his way to the meeting. The only light came from the moon, casting long shadows across his path. The manor house, a large, imposing structure, loomed out of the darkness, its windows dark. The quiet was almost unnerving after the constant buzz of Versailles. Inside, the atmosphere was electric. The room was dimly lit by a few candles, casting flickering shadows on the faces of those assembled. As Louis's eyes adjusted, he recognized several prominent figures, men and women he had only read about in newspapers or seen from a distance in the halls of the Estates General. Among them was Georges Danton, a man of imposing presence with a voice that could command a room. His passionate speeches in the National Assembly had earned him a reputation as a fervent advocate for the rights of the common man. Seated next to him was Camille Desmoulins, a young and fiery journalist whose writings had stirred the hearts of many in Paris. Beside him was the stoic and determined figure of Maximilien Robespierre, already known for his incorruptible moral compass and his unwavering commitment to the revolution. Louis was introduced as a new but committed member of the revolutionary cause, and he took his place among these giants with a mixture of awe and determination. The meeting began with a somber assessment of the situation. Danton's booming voice filled the room as he spoke of the dire conditions in Paris the stagnation of the Estates General, and the urgent need for action. We are at a crossroads, Danton declared, his gaze sweeping over the assembled group. We can no longer stand by as our countrymen suffer. It is time to take matters into our own hands. It is time for action. Nods of agreement met his words, and a palpable sense of resolve spread through the room. Desmoulins then took the floor, his youthful energy contrasting with Danton's seasoned intensity. He outlined a plan to distribute pamphlets to the masses, stirring up public support for a move against the current regime. Robespierre, ever cautious, spoke last. While I agree with Georges and Camille, he said, measuring each word carefully, we must also ensure that our actions are guided by principles, we seek not just to overthrow a regime, but to establish a fairer society. Our actions must reflect the justice and equality we strive to achieve. The debate that followed was intense. 
with voices rising and falling as strategies were argued. Louis listened intently, absorbing every word. When asked for his opinion, he spoke of his experiences in Paris, of the suffering he had witnessed and the fervor for change that simmered among the people. His words added weight to the urgency of the plans being formed. As the meeting drew to a close, Louis was tasked with returning to Paris to help coordinate the dissemination of the revolutionary materials Desmoulins had proposed. The responsibility was significant, and he felt both honoured and overwhelmed by the trust placed in him. Leaving the manor house that night, the world seemed to have shifted slightly on its axis. The quiet confidence that had taken hold of Louis as he walked back under the starlit sky was new and powerful. He was no longer just a spectator of history. He was a participant, one whose actions could influence the course of the revolution. As dawn broke over Versailles, the real work awaited him. With the words of Danton, Desmoulins and Robespierre echoing in his mind, Louis knew that the path ahead would be fraught with danger and challenges. But it was a path he chose willingly, driven by a vision of a France reborn in liberty and justice. The meeting in the manor had not just changed his life. It had sharpened his purpose, binding him irrevocably to the revolutionary cause that would soon engulf all of France. Chapter 5 the Estates General. In the spring of 1789, the air in France was charged with a palpable sense of urgency and expectation. The Estates General, a general assembly representing the three traditional estates of the realm, the clergy, the nobility, and the common people, was convened by King Louis XVI at Versailles. It was the first time this assembly had been called together in nearly 175 years, a desperate measure to address the deepening financial and social crises that gripped the nation. Louis, having just returned to Paris with the spirits of the secret meeting still burning in his heart, was acutely aware of the monumental importance of this assembly. Though not a delegate himself, he was deeply involved in the burgeoning revolutionary movement tasked with spreading information and rallying the common people to support significant reforms. The Estates General was a spectacle of grandeur and tension. The representatives of the first and second estates, clergy and nobility, arrived in luxurious carriages, dressed in fine silks and satins, while the third estate, representing the commoners, arrived mostly on foot, their clothes plain, but their determination evident. As the assembly began, the stark divisions between the estates became immediately apparent. The first and second estates sought to maintain their privileges, showing little concern for the hardships faced by the majority of the French people. In contrast, the third estate, led by figures like Emmanuel Joseph Sieyès, was vociferous in its demand for more representation and a new constitution that would ensure equal taxation and fair governance. Louis watched from the sidelines as the debates grew more heated. The Third Estate's deputies argued passionately for a voting system based on headcount, which would give them an advantage due to their larger numbers. However, the traditional method was by a state, with each estate having one vote, which meant the two privileged estates could outvote the Third Estate two to one. As the stalemate continued, frustration within the third estate mounted. Louis's role was to communicate the proceedings to the people of Paris, translating the complex debates into clear messages that fueled the growing revolutionary fervor. Each night he would meet with his fellow revolutionaries, discussing ways to support the third estate and planning demonstrations to show the widespread support for change. The turning point came in June, when the Third Estate took a bold step. Frustrated by the lack of progress and the clear obstruction from the other two estates, 
they declared themselves the National Assembly, an act of defiance that signaled a break from the traditional order. They invited the other estates to join them in forming a single body to govern France, but prepared to go it alone if necessary. Louis helped spread the news of this declaration, understanding its significance. The formation of the National Assembly was a direct challenge to the authority of the king and the established hierarchy. It was an assertion that sovereignty did not lie with the monarchy or with God, but with the people. In the days that followed, tensions escalated. The king, feeling threatened by the actions of the National Assembly, ordered the closure of the Salle des Etats where they met. In response, the deputies moved to a nearby indoor tennis court, where they took the famous tennis court oath, vowing not to disperse until a new French constitution had been adopted. Louis was there that day, among the crowds outside the tennis court, witnessing the deputies emerge with determined expressions. The scene was electric, the air thick with the promise of change. The people around him, artisans, shopkeepers, laborers, cheered and wept, feeling a part of something larger than themselves. Through his writings and speeches, Louis conveyed the gravity of this moment to the wider public. The story of the tennis court oath, with its dramatic refusal to be silenced, spread rapidly through Paris and beyond, becoming a symbol of the people's resolve and unity. The actions of the Estates General and the formation of the National Assembly intensified the revolutionary feelings throughout France. It was clear that there was no turning back. The seeds of revolution, sown in meetings and pamphlets, had taken root in the very structure of French governance. As Louis continued his work, he did so with a renewed sense of purpose, knowing that the struggle ahead would be arduous, but the cause was just. This pivotal chapter in the life of Louis and in the history of France set the stage for the dramatic events to come. The Estates General had started as a convention of delegates, but transformed into the birthplace of a revolution that would change the face of the nation forever. Chapter 6 The Storming of the Bastille July 14, 1789, dawned hot and oppressive, a day that would forever mark a turning point in French history. The air was thick with tension and the buzz of whispered conversations about gathering at the Bastille. For Louis, like many Parisians, the ancient fortress was a symbol of royal tyranny, a looming structure in the heart of the city that held prisoners and was stocked with gunpowder. From the early hours, Louis could feel the surge of people's anger and determination. He joined the swelling crowds, his heart pounding with a mixture of fear and exhilaration. The revolution had been ignited by words and debates, but today it would be stoked by action. Louis found himself among a diverse throng, workers, artisans, shopkeepers, and some deserters from the king's army all united with a common goal to seize the Bastille and, with it, their freedom. The march to the Bastille was chaotic. Shouts and songs of liberty filled the air, mingling with the sounds of marching feet and clashing weapons. As they neared the fortress, the imposing sight of its stone walls and fortified towers struck a chord of daunting reality in Louis's heart. This was no mere protest. This was an act of defiance against the might of the monarchy. Upon their arrival, the crowd demanded the surrender of the fortress and the release of the prisoners believed to be unjustly held within its walls. The standoff was tense. The governor of the Bastille, Marquis Bernard de Launay, appeared at the gates, attempting to negotiate, but the furious crowd was beyond diplomacy. They wanted action they wanted results. As negotiations faltered, the crowd's impatience turned into aggressive action. Armed with makeshift weapons and a few cannons taken from a nearby armory, they began a full assault on the Bastille. Louis, caught in the fervor of the moment, helped man one of the cannons, 
feeling the heavy vibration of each blast shaking his very soul. The battle was fierce and chaotic. Gunfire echoed off the stone walls of the fortress, and smoke blurred the air, stinging eyes and throats. Louis witnessed bravery and tragedy unfold together as men and women, fueled by years of oppression, fought with a desperate courage that could only be born from profound desire for liberty. After hours of relentless struggle, the defenders of the Bastille, overwhelmed and realizing the futility of their position, signaled their surrender. The gates were finally opened, and the revolutionaries flooded in. Louis stepped inside the courtyard, his senses overwhelmed by the sights and sounds of victory. Cheers erupted around him, mingling with cries of grief for the fallen. The fall of the Bastille was not just a physical victory, it was a monumental symbol of the people's power over their oppressors. The few prisoners found inside were released, but more importantly, the capture of the fortress provided the revolutionaries with much-needed arms and gunpowder. As the news spread across Paris, and then to the farthest provinces of France, it ignited revolutionary fervor throughout the country. That evening, as Louis walked through the streets of Paris, the city seemed transformed. Barricades were still up, and the smoke of burning embers tinted the sunset. But there was a palpable change in the air, a sense of having crossed an irrevocable line towards liberty. The storming of the Bastille would go down in history as the day the French people rose up in arms against tyranny. For Louis, it was both profound and personal. He had not just witnessed history, he had been a part of it. The ideals of freedom and equality he had read about and discussed so fervently had been put to the ultimate test and the people had prevailed. As the new reality of a nation in revolution settled in, Louis understood that the path ahead would be fraught with challenges. But the fall of the Bastille had shown him and his fellow citizens that the foundations of change, once set in motion, were unshakable. The day's events had not only dismantled a fortress, but had begun the construction of a new framework of governance, one built on the hopes and aspirations of its people. Chapter 7 The Declaration of the Rights of Man In the weeks following the storming of the Bastille, the revolutionary spirit that swept through Paris began to crystallize into concrete actions aimed at reshaping French society. One of the most significant of these actions was the drafting of the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen. For Louis, as for many of his contemporaries, this document symbolized the ideals and aspirations of the Revolution. August 1789 was marked by intense debates within the newly formed National Assembly. Louis, though not a delegate, was deeply involved behind the scenes working with legislators and penning articles that argued for specific rights and freedoms to be recognized. The atmosphere was charged with a sense of urgency and possibility. Every day brought heated discussions about what should be included in the Declaration, reflecting the diverse hopes of a nation on the brink of reinventing itself. The Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen was inspired by the Enlightenment principles that Louis had admired since his youth. Philosophers like John Locke and Jean-Jacques Rousseau had argued for natural rights, which belonged to each person from birth, and now these ideas were to be codified into French law. The Declaration asserted that all men were born free and equal in rights. It spoke of liberty, property, security, and resistance to oppression, principles that resonated deeply with Louis and his fellow revolutionaries. Louis was particularly moved by the article that proclaimed freedom of speech and press as one of the most precious rights. Having been involved in the distribution of revolutionary pamphlets and seeing firsthand the power of information, 
this right held a special significance for him. He knew that maintaining this freedom was crucial for the future of the revolution and for ensuring that no single power could ever again silence the people. As the draft of the Declaration circulated, Louis took it upon himself to explain its implications to the citizens of Paris. Standing on makeshift platforms in busy marketplaces or at the end of church services, he would read aloud the articles of the Declaration, breaking them down into simpler terms. He discussed with butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers, ensuring that everyone, regardless of their social standing or education, understood what was being fought for. The adoption of the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen on August 26, 1789, was a triumph for the revolution. It did not just create a new moral and legal foundation for France. It sent a message across Europe and the world that the days of absolute monarchy were ending and that the people could govern themselves. For Louis, the Declaration was both a victory and a reminder of the responsibilities now resting on the shoulders of every French citizen. It was one thing to tear down an oppressive regime, but another to build a just society in its place. The ideals laid out in the Declaration provided a blueprint, but it would take continuous effort and vigilance to implement them. The impact of the Declaration was immediate and profound. It became a rallying point for further reforms and was a critical step in the process of drafting a constitution. It also intensified the political debate within France as various factions argued about how to interpret and implement these rights. Amidst this transformative period, Louis continued his work with a renewed sense of purpose. He felt a deep connection to the Declaration, not just as a revolutionary, but as a citizen of France. He saw it as a promise made to every French person, a promise that he was determined to help keep. Through his ongoing efforts to educate and engage with his fellow citizens, Louis contributed to the growing awareness and support for the revolutionary changes. He knew that the true measure of the Declaration's success would be in the everyday lives of the people it was meant to protect. His commitment to the cause never wavered, driven by the belief that the principles of 1789 would lead to a fairer, more equitable France. As the revolution continued to unfold, Louis stood firm in his dedication, inspired by the declaration he had helped champion, a document that would light the way forward for him and his nation. Chapter 8. The Reign of Terror as the new structure of the French Republic began to solidify, the revolution that had been fueled by high ideals and a quest for equality found itself overshadowed by darker forces. The period known as the Reign of Terror, which began in September 1793, marked one of the most tumultuous and frightening phases of the French Revolution. For Louis, it was a time of profound internal conflict and moral questioning. The Committee of Public Safety, led by figures like Maximilien Robespierre, had taken control, and its measures to protect the revolution from its enemies were drastic and often deadly. The guillotine, previously a symbol of liberation from the tyranny of the monarchy, became a tool of terror. It was a time when suspicion and fear permeated every aspect of daily life. Neighbors turned against neighbors, and even casual remarks could be construed as treasonous. Louis, who had once stood on the barricades with hope for a just France, found himself caught in a whirlwind of paranoia and repression. His role in the revolution, once clear and driven by the principles of the Declaration of the Rights of Man, now felt fraught with danger and disillusionment. The very principles he had fought for seemed to be unravelling as the new government instituted what it called measures of revolutionary justice. The streets of Paris, once vibrant with the spirit of change, now often ran red with the blood of the executed. Public executions were common, drawing crowds that were a mixture of the horrified, 
and the morbidly fascinated. Louis witnessed these events with a growing sense of horror, recognizing some of the faces that fell beneath the guillotine's blade as those who had once fought alongside him for liberty. One day, a close friend of Louis Henri was arrested on dubious charges of counter-revolutionary activities. Louis knew Henri to be a devoted patriot, but in the hysteria of the times, such distinctions mattered little. The arrest threw Louis into a deep moral quandary. Should he risk his own safety to defend Henry, or should he remain silent and protect himself and his family? As he wrestled with this decision, Louis felt the very foundations of his beliefs being tested. The revolution was supposed to have abolished the arbitrary judgments and abuses of power that characterized the old regime. Yet here he was, witnessing a new form of tyranny being justified in the name of security. After much inner turmoil, Louis decided he could not stand idly by. He used his connections to seek out members of the Committee of Public Safety, arguing fervently for Henry's release. His efforts were met with cold indifference, and the danger to his own life grew with every word he spoke in defense of his friend. The night before Henry's scheduled execution, Louis visited him in prison. They spoke of their hopes for the revolution, their dreams now tainted by the reality around them. Henry urged Louis to look after his family and to continue fighting for a true republic, one that embodied the ideals they had once cherished together. Their farewell was a poignant reminder of the human cost of the terror. Henry was executed the next day, and his death left Louis shaken but resolute. He realized that to honor his friend's memory and the original goals of the revolution, he must strive even harder to steer the course of events back toward justice and away from vengeance. The reign of terror eventually came to an end in July 1794, when Robespierre himself was overthrown and executed. The period had taken a heavy toll on the nation and on individuals like Louis. He emerged from this dark time with a clearer vision of what he must do. No longer could he merely react to the events around him. He needed to actively work toward rebuilding a society grounded in the values that had first inspired him to take up the revolutionary cause. The reign of terror taught Louis the difficult lesson that the pursuit of liberty could sometimes lead to devastating consequences when not tempered by humanity and a steadfast moral compass. Moving forward, he dedicated himself to advocating for a balance between security and freedom, a legacy of the terror that he hoped would never be repeated in the history of his country. Chapter 9 the guillotine's shadow. The reign of terror had subsided, but its dark legacy lingered in the hearts and minds of the French people. The guillotine, once a distant symbol of state power, had etched a permanent shadow over the city of Paris. For Louis, the scars were personal and profound, as many of his friends and close allies had fallen victim to its cold, unyielding blade. This chapter of his life was marked by loss and the haunting presence of political terror that continued to influence every decision he made. After the death of his friend Henri, Louis found himself increasingly isolated in a city that was slowly trying to heal from its wounds. The atmosphere was one of suspicion and lingering fear. People spoke in hushed tones, wary of attracting attention, for the machinery of accusation and retribution had not entirely ceased. In this climate, Louis struggled to navigate his daily life, torn between his desire to rekindle the spirit of the revolution and the need to protect those he loved from further harm. One such person was Madeleine, a fellow revolutionary who had worked tirelessly with Louis to spread the ideals of freedom and equality in the early days of the uprising. Madeleine was a fiery orator, known for her impassioned speeches that rallied crowds and challenged the status quo. However, her prominence also made her a target. 
Despite the fall of Robespierre and the official end of the terror, old grudges and political rivalries persisted, leaving figures like Madeleine vulnerable. The day came when Madeleine was arrested, charged with inciting rebellion against the fragile government that had emerged in the terror's aftermath. Louis was devastated, but determined to save her. He employed every means at his disposal, leveraging his connections and exhausting his resources to advocate for her release. He wrote letters, met with officials, and even offered himself as a guarantor for her conduct. As Madeleine's trial approached, Louis visited her in prison, finding her defiant but resigned to her fate. Their conversation was a mixture of hope and despair. Madeleine spoke passionately about her belief in the revolution's principles and her acceptance of the risks she had taken. If my voice can no longer cry out for justice, let my silence be a testament to our cause she told Louis. Her strength fortified him, yet her impending loss was a bitter pill to swallow. On the day of Madeleine's execution, Louis stood among the crowd, his heart heavy with grief. As the blade fell, a part of him fell with it. The crowd dispersed in silent acquiescence, a stark contrast to the uproarious gatherings that had once celebrated the fall of the Bastille. This silence was more terrifying to Louis than the shouts of anger and fear that had characterized the terror. The loss of Madeleine was a turning point for Louis. It forced him to confront the harsh realities of the political landscape that the revolution had morphed into. The ideals they had fought for seemed to be slipping away replaced by a new form of tyranny that was as oppressive as the monarchy they had overthrown. Haunted by the shadows of the guillotine, Louis withdrew from active political life for a time. He took to writing, chronicling the events he had witnessed and the lessons he had learned. His writings were not just a tribute to those he had lost, but a warning to future generations about the dangers of unchecked power and the fragility of human rights in times of crisis. Through his grief, Louis began to understand that true revolution was not just about changing rulers or systems of government. It was about transforming the very heart of society, nurturing compassion and understanding among its people. He realized that the fight for justice and equality was a continuous struggle one that required not just the courage to stand up to tyranny, but also the wisdom to know when to seek peace and reconciliation. As Louis aged, his efforts shifted towards education and mentorship. He became a figure of quiet strength in his community, teaching young minds about the values of democracy and the lessons of the past. In every lesson, the memory of the guillotine's shadow lingered, a somber reminder of the cost of freedom and the price of its preservation. Chapter 10 The Rise of Napoleon As the French Revolution evolved, it gave way to new power structures and emerging leaders. Among them was a figure whose ambition and military prowess would soon dominate not just France, but much of Europe, Napoleon Bonaparte. For Louis, who had witnessed the highs and lows of revolutionary fervor, the rise of Napoleon presented both a hope for stability and a concern over the potential return to authoritarian rule. The late 1790s were a period of significant turmoil and change. The Directory, the government that had taken over after the fall of Robespierre, was proving ineffective, marred by corruption, and unable to manage the ongoing financial crises or quell rising social unrest. In this climate, a strong and decisive leader like Napoleon found ample opportunity to ascend. Louis first heard of Napoleon as a young and daring general who had scored impressive victories in Italy for the French Republic. His military exploits were celebrated, his strategic genius admired, 
but it was Napoleon's return from Egypt in 1799 that marked the turning point. Amidst widespread acclaim, Napoleon leveraged his popularity to stage a coup d'etat, overthrowing the Directory and eventually establishing himself as First Consul and later as Emperor. For Louis, who had long advocated for a republic founded on democratic principles, Napoleon's ascent was a complex development. On one hand, he appreciated the order and national pride that Napoleon's leadership brought. Under Napoleon, France saw significant reforms, legal codes, new educational systems, and infrastructure improvements that revitalized and modernized the country. Yet, Louis could not fully embrace a regime that, while efficient, centralized power once again in the hands of one man. The memories of the monarchy and the excesses of the revolution were too vivid, too painful. He watched cautiously as Napoleon expanded his power, rewriting the constitution to strengthen his hold on France and reduce the power of the legislative bodies. Louis' ambivalence grew as he observed Napoleon's foreign policy. The wars that expanded French territory across Europe were initially popular. They were seen as spreading the revolutionary ideals. However, as the wars dragged on, they brought about immense suffering and led to widespread disillusionment. Throughout this period, Louis maintained a correspondence with other intellectuals and former revolutionaries who shared his concerns. They debated Napoleon's role. Was he the savior of France's revolutionary gains? Or was he a new tyrant, cloaked in the mantle of republicanism? In his writings from this time, Louis reflected on the nature of power and leadership. He acknowledged Napoleon's achievements, but cautioned against the cult of personality that seemed to be forming around him. To Louis, true leadership required not just strength but restraint, not just authority but consent. Despite his reservations, Louis recognized that Napoleon had in many ways stabilized a country that had been torn apart by a decade of upheaval. The civil chaos had subsided, and public order had returned. For many French citizens, weary of instability, Napoleon's rule was a welcome change. In the later years of Napoleon's rule, as the emperor increasingly resorted to authoritarian measures, Louis' fears seemed justified. The reinstatement of censorship and the suppression of political dissent were troubling to him. Yet he also saw that opposition to Napoleon could fragment the country once again. Thus, Louis advocated for a balanced view, supporting the government when it worked for the welfare of the people and criticizing it when it did not. As Napoleon's empire eventually began to crumble under the weight of continuous wars and a disastrous invasion of Russia, Louis pondered the cyclical nature of history. He observed how easily the gains of revolution could be lost, and how quickly a liberator could become a despot. Louis's experiences and reflections during the rise of Napoleon reinforced his belief in the importance of vigilance in a democracy. He continued to write and teach, emphasizing the need for citizens to remain informed and engaged. For Louis, the rise of Napoleon was both a testament to the potential for greatness in leadership and a cautionary tale of the fragility of democratic ideals in the face of unchecked ambition. His life, shaped by the tumult of revolution and the complexities of power, was a continuous quest to reconcile the ideals of liberty with the realities of governance. Chapter 11. Reflections in Exile the fall of Napoleon brought a new regime, but for many who had been integral to the revolutionary movements, it also meant a time of reckoning. Louis, once an ardent supporter of the Republic and a critic of Napoleon's authoritarian drift, found himself a target in the turbulent political climate of the Restoration. His outspoken views and revolutionary ties led to his exile, a fate that gave him both a sanctuary and a prison of solitude away from France. 
He settled in a small nondescript town across the border in Belgium, where the past and its glories seemed both incredibly close and impossibly distant. As the days stretched into months, Louis spent much of his time in a modest study filled with books and papers, the tools of his trade and the companions of his solitude. From this small room, he penned a series of essays and letters reflecting on the tumultuous years of the French Revolution and the Napoleonic era. It was during these quiet, reflective moments that Louis grappled with the outcomes of the revolution and his role within it. His exile forced him to confront questions that the chaos of revolutionary activities had kept at bay. Had the revolution truly achieved its ideals of liberté, égalité, fraternité? What of the terror and the tyranny that had followed? Louis wrestled with these questions, finding no easy answers. The revolution had promised so much, a break from oppressive monarchy, a society based on equality and reason. But at times, it had delivered so little descending into violence and despotism. Louis's reflections were tinged with personal regrets as well. He thought of friends lost to the guillotine's unforgiving blade, lives claimed in the name of liberty, but lost to terror. He pondered his own choices, the moments when he could have spoken out more strongly against the excesses, or done more to steer the revolution on a steadier course. The isolation of exile sharpened these thoughts, each memory a reminder of his ideals and the harsh realities that had challenged them. Yet, it was not all despair in his reflection. Louis also remembered moments of true fraternity, times when people from all walks of life came together to fight for a common cause. He recalled the early days of the Estates General, the passionate debates in the National Assembly, and the hopeful discussions in hidden salons and coffee houses. These memories served as a reminder of the revolution's potential to inspire and unify. In his writings, Louis sought to balance his critique with acknowledgement of the revolution's achievements. The abolition of feudal privileges, the establishment of civil equality, and the secularization of the state were monumental shifts that had reshaped French society. Even the Napoleonic Code, though implemented under an authoritarian regime, had modernized and unified French law in ways that benefited many. His time in exile also gave Louis the space to think about the future. He wrote extensively about the need for vigilance and engagement in governance. Drawing from his own experiences, he argued that the price of liberty was eternal vigilance, that each generation must be ready to defend and renew the promises of freedom and justice. Louis's letters from exile eventually found an audience beyond his immediate circle. They were smuggled back into France, circulated among those who shared his disillusionment, and those who still held on to the ideals of the revolution. His words sparked discussions and debates echoing the intellectual salons of his earlier days. As years passed, the harsh edges of his regrets softened into a more nuanced understanding of the revolution's complex legacy. Louis came to see that revolutions are not singular events, but processes that unfold and evolve over generations. His reflections, once full of sharp regrets, gradually embraced a broader perspective of hope, a hope that the principles he had fought for would continue to influence and shape the foundations of society. Chapter 12. Secret Correspondence In the quiet solitude of his exile, Lewis found a renewed sense of purpose through a clandestine network of correspondence. With ink and paper, he connected with other exiles scattered across Europe, former revolutionaries who, like him, had been swept away by the tides of political retribution following the upheavals of the Napoleonic era. Together, they shared a silent yet profound dialogue about the past, present, and future of their beloved France. Louis's modest study was filled with the soft rustling of papers, 
and the scratching of his quill as he penned another letter by the dim light of a candle. Each letter was a delicate thread weaving through the complex tapestry of revolutionary ideals and the harsh reality of their consequences. These were not merely letters, they were lifelines, sustaining a fragile hope that France might once again find its way back to the principles that had ignited the revolution. The network was secretive, necessary to protect its members from potential retribution. Letters were coded and passed through multiple intermediaries. A simple phrase about the weather might discuss leadership changes, while a comment on crop yields might analyze economic policies. This cryptic dialogue allowed Louis and his fellow exiles to remain engaged with the ongoing political developments in France without risking their safety. One evening, as a cool breeze whispered through the open window of his study, Louis received a letter from Madeleine's brother, Jacques, who had also fled to Belgium. Jacques was more optimistic about the possibility of returning to France believing that the current regime might soften its stance towards the revolution's old proponents. His letter spoke of potential reforms and hinted at forming a new political group that sought to influence these changes from within. Louis felt a stir of excitement, a mix of apprehension and hope, as he read Jacques's words. He drafted a careful response, expressing his cautious optimism. He proposed a series of educational reforms that could help heal the nation's wounds. Education, Louis argued, was the key to nurturing a generation that could uphold and cherish the values of liberty, equality, and fraternity. Over the months, these letters grew in significance. They became a forum for debate and planning, discussing not just the theoretical aspects of governance, but practical steps that could be taken to reintegrate themselves into French society and influence its course. Each correspondent brought their perspective, enriching the dialogue with their experiences and insights. However, the risks were ever-present. One cold winter night, a knock at the door shattered the quiet routine of Louis's exile. A fellow exile, breathless and cloaked in darkness, brought news that one of their network had been arrested trying to cross back into France with a cache of their letters. The group was compromised, and they needed to act quickly to protect themselves. In a flurry of activity, Louis gathered his correspondence, burning the letters in his fireplace. The flames consumed words of hope, strategy, and shared dreams. It was a painful loss but necessary to protect his friends and their cause. As the last embers died out, Louis sat back and reflected on the fragility of their endeavour. The incident forced the network to be even more cautious, but it also reinforced their resolve. Their secret correspondence resumed with new codes and safer methods of delivery. Each letter was a testament to their enduring commitment to see a free and fair France. As the years passed, the political climate in France shifted. The harsh policies of the Restoration began to soften, and the possibility of amnesty for exiles like Louis grew stronger. The network's discussions turned from theoretical planning to preparations for their return. Louis's letters from this period reflect a blend of nostalgia for the revolutionary fervour of his youth and a pragmatic approach to the future. He wrote extensively about the importance of forgiveness and reconciliation in rebuilding France. He urged his fellow exiles to return not as avengers, but as builders, ready to apply the lessons learned from their successes and failures. Finally, the day came when Louis received a letter sealed with the new French Republic's emblem. It was an official pardon, inviting him to return home. As he held the letter in his trembling hands, Louis felt the weight of the years lift slightly. His journey in exile had come full circle, and he was going home, 
armed with the knowledge and ideas that had been sharpened by years of secret correspondence. These letters, once hidden and coded, would now serve as the foundation for his contributions to a reborn France, a country still struggling with its revolutionary legacy, but hopeful for its future. Chapter 13 Return to Paris After years of exile, the day finally arrived for Louis to return to his beloved Paris. The city he had left had been a place of revolutionary fervor and tumult. The Paris he returned to was markedly different, shaped by the authoritarian hand of Napoleon, and now transitioning into a new era under the restored Bourbon monarchy. His return was cloaked in secrecy, not from fear of the government, but from a desire to observe the changes unencumbered by the expectations of those who knew him. Louis's journey back was a mix of apprehension and longing. As the carriage rolled through the French countryside, each familiar landmark stirred memories of his youth and his time as a revolutionary. But it was the approach to Paris that tightened the strings of his heart. The city's skyline, dominated by the still-standing Notre Dame, brought a rush of emotions. Paris had been the heart of so much history, much of which he had helped to make. Upon arriving, Louis did not immediately reveal himself to his old acquaintances. Instead, he rented a small room in an inconspicuous inn in the Marais district, from where he could wander the city incognito. The streets of Paris were quieter than he remembered. The revolutionary posters that once plastered every wall replaced by royal decrees and commercial advertisements. The regime change had clearly left its mark. The grand ideals of the revolution seemed to have been smoothed over, replaced by a cautious optimism mixed with a weariness born of years of political upheaval. The return of the monarchy under King Louis XIV was met with mixed feelings by the populace. Some welcomed the stability it promised, while others, like Louis, remembered too well the costs of absolute rule. As Louis walked the streets, he noted how the city had changed under Napoleon's rule. Monumental buildings and statues dedicated to the glory of the empire adorned the boulevards. The Arc de Triomphe, still under construction, stood as a testament to Napoleon's ambition, meant to immortalize the victories of his Grande Armée. Paris, under Napoleon, had aimed to recast itself as a city of order and grandeur, a far cry from the chaotic energy of the revolutionary years. The social fabric of the city had also transformed. The stark class divisions that had fueled the early revolutionary fervor were less visibly pronounced, yet not entirely diminished. The bourgeoisie, empowered by Napoleonic reforms that favored merit over birthright, now walked with a sense of entitlement that rivaled that of the old nobility. In his first weeks back, Louis met secretly with some of his former comrades who had also returned from exile or survived the shifts in power. Their reunions were bittersweet, filled with tales of loss and endurance. They shared stories of friends lost to the guillotine, battles fought under the tricolor flag, and the harsh realities of life under Napoleon's strict regime. Despite the changes, the revolutionary spirit was not entirely extinguished. In whispered conversations in dimly lit cafes, Louis found that the ideals of liberté, égalité, fraternité still burned in the hearts of many. The current calm seemed superficial, a veneer beneath which the embers of revolution smouldered, waiting for a chance to flare up again. Louis's return to Paris was not just a physical journey, but a re-entry into the political life of France. He began to write again, his articles infused with the wisdom gained from his years of reflection. He advocated for a balance between the stability that the monarchy aimed to provide and the need for continued reform to ensure the rights and freedoms for which the revolution had been fought. Chapter 14 
the new normal. As the dust settled from the tumultuous years of revolution and the swift rise of Napoleon, Louis found himself navigating a Paris transformed. The initial uncertainty of his return had given way to a cautious acceptance of the new order, a regime that Napoleon had crafted with a deft combination of authoritarianism and substantial reform. This new normal was not what Louis had envisioned in the heady days of the revolution, but it was the reality he now had to live within. Under Napoleon, France had undergone a series of radical transformations. The Napoleonic Code had replaced the jumble of legal systems with a unified set of laws that, for all its faults, offered a semblance of legal fairness previously unseen. Education had been reformed, with a focus on creating a citizenry literate in both letters and the ideals of the Republic, albeit under the watchful eye of the state. Louis, once a firebrand revolutionary, found his role in this new society as both an observer and a participant. His days were spent walking the streets of Paris, now lined with neoclassical buildings that spoke of a new empire's grandeur and ambition. The wide boulevards, designed to prevent the kind of barricade building that had marked the revolution, were both a practical urban development and a symbol of Napoleon's desire to control and reshape the city. In this reorganized Paris, Louis resumed his work as a writer and teacher. He found his students to be of a new generation, one that had not lived through the revolution's chaos, but grew up under the stability and militaristic patriotism of Napoleonic France. They were eager, full of the same passionate curiosity that had once driven him, but their questions were different. They sought to understand not how to overthrow a regime, but how to live within and possibly improve the framework of the existing one. Lewis's evenings were often spent in salons that had once again become centres of intellectual debate, albeit less politically charged than before. Here, the conversations swirled around the implications of Napoleon's policies, the expansion of the empire, and the role of France in the wider world. Louis engaged in these discussions, sharing his revolutionary experiences and the lessons learned about the cost of freedom and the weight of authoritarian rule. Despite the apparent calm, the society was underpinned by a complex web of surveillance and control. The police state was efficient and pervasive, ensuring that dissent was monitored and managed with a precision that Louis found both impressive and disconcerting. He wrote about these experiences, his articles taking on a nuanced tone, acknowledging the benefits of stability and order while lamenting the loss of certain freedoms he had fought for. Louis also witnessed the impact of the continental system, Napoleon's ambitious scheme to blockade Britain, which had mixed results economically. While it aimed to boost French industries, it also led to shortages and high prices, reminding Louis of the days of bread queues and revolutionary fervour. He saw how these economic strains tested the loyalty of the French people to Napoleon, especially among the working classes and artisans, whose livelihoods were often on the line. Throughout all these changes, Louis maintained a correspondence with other intellectuals across Europe, exchanging ideas and perspectives that broadened his understanding of France's place in the world. These letters helped him piece together a broader picture of the European reaction to Napoleon's rule, from admiration in some corners to fear and animosity in others. As years passed, Louis adapted to life under Napoleon's rule, finding ways to contribute to his society while holding on to his ideals. He mentored young thinkers and writers, urging them to think critically about their governance and the balance between security and liberty. His life had come full circle from revolutionary fervor through bitter disillusionment to a tempered engagement with the new normal. Chapter 15 Old Allies Several years had passed since Louis returned to Paris, 
and the city, under the regime of Napoleon, had settled into a rhythm of subdued grandeur. It was during this period of relative stability that Louis organized a reunion of his old revolutionary allies. Each had taken different paths in the intervening years, and the reunion was a chance to reconnect and reflect on the journey they had all undertaken from the fervor of revolution to the complex realities of life under a new kind of rule. The gathering was held in a discreet corner of a favored café that had once served as a meeting place for discussions of liberty and fraternity. The walls, still adorned with faded murals of Marianne, the personification of the French Republic, served as a poignant reminder of their shared past. As each figure entered the café, there were warm embraces and somber nods, the lines on their faces marking the passage of time and the weight of their experiences. Among the group was Claire, once a fiery speaker at the barricades, now a teacher in a girls' school established under the Napoleonic reforms. Her role had shifted from agitator to educator, shaping the minds of young women to think critically about their society. She spoke with a tempered passion about the importance of education in securing the revolution's ideals for future generations. Then there was Etienne, who had spent years on the front lines of Napoleon's campaigns across Europe. His once idealistic view of spreading revolutionary ideals through conquest had been hardened by the realities of war. He shared tales of battles and sieges, but more poignantly, he spoke of the disillusionment of seeing empires rise and fall, questioning whether the cost in human lives had been worth the fleeting glories. Another attendee was Sophie, who had used her skills to rise within the ranks of the new bureaucracy Napoleon had built. Her position gave her an insider's perspective on the workings of the government. While she acknowledged the efficiencies and order brought about by Napoleon's administrative reforms, she expressed a deep sense of unease at the erosion of democratic freedoms, a sentiment echoed by many around the table. Louis listened intently, occasionally chiming in with his own experiences. He talked about his years in exile and the perspective it had given him on the revolution's impact, not just in France, but across the world. His return to Paris had been a journey back not just to a place, but to a complex legacy that each of them had helped to create. As the evening progressed, the conversation turned to the present and the future. There was a shared concern about the creeping return of monarchical principles even under the guise of an empire that claimed to uphold the revolution's outcomes. They debated their roles in this new society, whether to push for more changes or to protect what had been achieved from potential regression. Amid the serious discussions, there was also laughter and reminiscences of younger days, of hope and camaraderie. They recalled the unity and purpose they had felt as they stood together on the streets of Paris, dreaming of a better world. Those memories, though tinged with the harsh hues of later struggles, remained a fundamental part of their identity. As the night drew to a close, Louis proposed a toast. To the paths we've walked, the battles we've fought, and the future we still hope to shape, he declared. Glasses were raised in a solemn salute to past dreams and future aspirations. The reunion, although brief, reaffirmed their shared commitment to the principles for which they had once risked everything. They parted with promises to support one another, understanding that while the revolution might have ended, the fight for its ideals did not. Each left with a renewed sense of purpose, knowing that the bonds forged in the fires of revolution were as strong as ever, providing a foundation on which they could continue to build a just society. Chapter 16 Final Years As the twilight years of Louis's life approached, 
he found himself reflecting on the long shadow his generation had cast over the landscape of French politics. The fervor of revolution had given way to the measured tread of progress and occasional regression. From his modest apartment in Paris, Louis continued to write and engage with the political discourse, his thoughts now seasoned with the wisdom of age and experience. Louis's later years were marked by a growing respect from both new and old political players. Though the empire had fallen and the monarchy restored, his voice remained relevant, a bridge between the revolutionary zeal of 1789 and the evolving French Republic. His writings, once radical, were now viewed as the thoughtful reflections of a statesman who had witnessed the full arc of his nation's tumultuous history. His days were spent mentoring young writers and politicians, imparting lessons from the past to guide the future. His salon, a quiet room lined with books and memorabilia from a bygone era, became a haven for lively debates and discussions. Here, the old revolutionary fires were tempered but not extinguished, as Louis challenged his protégés to question and critique the very principles he had helped to establish. In his public life, Louis was often invited to speak at universities and civic events where he talked about the importance of maintaining vigilance in the face of power. His speeches were rich with historical insight, drawing parallels between the past and current events, urging a new generation to guard the fragile gains of liberty and justice. Despite his advanced age, Louis's mind remained sharp, his pen active. He authored several more books, combining personal memoir with political theory, which were well received and widely read. These works served not only as a chronicle of his life, but as a commentary on the ongoing struggle for democratic governance. Chapter 17 The Legacy The legacy of Louis, as he approached the end of his life, was a tapestry woven through the many lives he had touched and the words he had written. When he passed away, peacefully in his study, surrounded by his books and papers, the nation mourned not just the man, but the era he represented. Tributes poured in from across France and beyond. Historians lauded his contributions to the revolutionary cause and his efforts to shape the republic that followed. Politicians of various stripes acknowledged his influence on French political thought. Perhaps most touching were the remembrances from those who had sat in his salon, whose intellectual fires he had kindled with his passion and wisdom. Louis's funeral was attended by a diverse crowd, aging revolutionaries, young students, politicians, and common Parisians. Eulogies recounted his deeds and his words, painting the picture of a man who had remained committed to his ideals through every trial and triumph. In accordance with his wishes, Louis's personal papers, including letters, manuscripts, and first editions of his works, were donated to a public library. This collection became a valuable resource for scholars and a testament to his life's work. The library established a special section dedicated to the study of the French Revolution, named in his honor. Beyond his written contributions, Louis's legacy lived on in the policies and principles he had helped to shape. The emphasis on education, civic responsibility, and the rule of law that he had championed became pillars of the modern French state. His belief in reasoned discourse and political engagement inspired ongoing reforms and continued to influence French politics. Louis was remembered not as a hero carved out of the untouchable marble of legend, but as a man of flesh and blood who had dared to dream of a better world. His story, marked by both failure and achievement, offered a nuanced lesson. That history is made by human hands and that its course is shaped by those who take up the mantle of responsibility with integrity and courage. The books and articles he left behind were his final gifts, guideposts for future generations navigating the complexities of liberty and governance. 
In them, Louis spoke not from a pedestal, but as a fellow traveller on the road to a just society. His voice, through his writings, would continue to echo in the halls of academia, the corridors of power, and the quiet corners of ordinary lives, urging all who listened to engage, to think, and to act with the courage of their convictions in the ongoing journey of democracy. Chapter 17 The Legacy As the golden hues of autumn swept through Paris, painting the leaves of the Tuileries garden in vibrant shades of orange and red, Louis's life drew to a peaceful close. His passing was quiet, much like the man he had become in his later years, a thoughtful observer and a gentle influencer in the world of French politics and education. Louis's life spanned the most turbulent and transformative periods in French history. From the fervor of the revolution through the rise and fall of Napoleon to the restoration of the monarchy, he had been a participant and a chronicler, his life's work intertwined with the very fabric of French national identity. As news of his death spread, reflections on his impact began to surface in various circles academic, political, and public. Academic Legacy In universities and scholarly circles, Louis was remembered as a pivotal figure in the intellectual history of the Revolution. His writings provided a first-hand account of the ideological underpinnings of revolutionary action and the complex aftermath. Professors cited his works in lectures on political theory, French history, and philosophy, using his life as a case study of the moral and ethical dilemmas faced by revolutionaries. His extensive collection of personal papers donated to a public library became a treasured archive for students and historians, offering insights not only into his thoughts, but also into the spirit of the times. Political Influence Politically, Louis was lauded for his steadfast commitment to the principles of liberty, equality and fraternity, even when such ideals fell out of favour with the ruling powers. Throughout his life, he had served as a conscience for the nation, persistently advocating for a balance between authority and individual freedoms. His dialogues with political leaders, though often fraught with tension, had helped shape policies that aimed to incorporate democratic values into the governance of France, even under the autocratic rule of Napoleon and the restored monarchy. Public Perception Among the public, Louis was celebrated as a champion of the common people, a man who had risen from modest beginnings to stand at the forefront of a national movement. His story was featured in newspapers and books resonating particularly with young people aspiring to make their own impact on the world. His commitment to education and his role in establishing schools and learning programs were highlighted in community gatherings, inspiring a new generation to value and pursue knowledge. Final Reflections and Commemorations Lewis's funeral was attended by a diverse array of individuals whose lives he had touched. Eulogies painted him as a man of great integrity and vision, who had navigated the challenges of his times with a rare blend of pragmatism and idealism. In the weeks following his death, articles and memoirs flooded the media, each adding layers to the narrative of his life and legacy. A year after his death, a statue was erected in a small park near where he had lived. It depicted Louis not as a grand hero, but as a thoughtful writer, with a book in one hand and a quill in the other, looking off into the distance. The inscription beneath read, Louis underscore 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 educator, revolutionary statesman. He taught us to think, to question, and to dream. As the years turned into decades, Louis's legacy continued to inspire. His life became a symbol of the enduring power of ideas and the impact one individual can have on the course of history. Teachers taught lessons based on his writings, politicians cited his works in debates, and students visited his statue and archives, 
drawing inspiration from his journey.